There was a crooked man, and he went a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence beside a crooked stile. He caught a crooked cat, which caught a crooked mouse, and they all lived together in a little crooked house. I first met Sophia Leonides in Egypt towards the end of World War II. She had quite an important job working for the government, and when I worked with her, I soon realized how good at her job she was, though she was only twenty-two. As well as being very good-looking, Sophia had a clear mind and a delightful sense of humor. We became friends. She was easy to talk to, and we enjoyed our dinners and dances together very much. But it wasn't until I was ordered to go to East Asia at the end of the war in Europe that I realized I loved Sophia and wanted to marry her. We were having dinner together when I realized this. It wasn't a surprise. I think I'd known for a long time that I loved her. I looked at Sophia and liked everything I saw. She had dark hair and bright blue eyes, a small chin and a straight nose. She looked very English. Then, suddenly, I wondered if she really was as English as she looked. After all, her surname didn't sound English. Although we'd talked about many things, Sophia had never mentioned her home or her family. I didn't know anything about her background. Sophia asked me what I was thinking about. You, I replied truthfully. I may not see you for a few years, Sophia, but when I get back to England, I'm going to ask you to marry me. She sat there calmly. I'm not going to ask you now, I continued, because you might say no, and I'd be very unhappy. And if you say yes, I don't want to be engaged for years, or get married now and then leave you straight away. I want you to go home free and independent and decide what you really want. But I wanted to let you know how I, well, how I feel. But you don't want to be too romantic, murmured Sophia. Darling, don't you understand? I, I tried not to say I love you. She stopped me. I do understand, Charles. And I like your funny way of doing things. You can come and see me when you get back, if you still want to. Of course I'll want to, I interrupted. You don't know that, said Sophia. You don't know much about me, do you? No, I admitted. I don't even know where in England you live. I live just outside London at a place called Swinley Dean, she said, in a little crooked house. I must have looked surprised, because she explained why she had used the last line of a nursery rhyme. My family, she said, and they all lived together in a little crooked house. That's us, and though the house isn't really little, it's definitely crooked. So, do you have a large family? I asked. One brother, one sister, a mother, a father, an uncle, an aunt by marriage, a grandfather, a great-aunt, and a step-grandmother. My goodness! I exclaimed in surprise. Of course, we don't normally all live together, Sophia laughed. It was because of the war. With the bombing, it was too dangerous to stay in London. But my grandfather takes care of us. He's over eighty and very small, but he's so alive that, compared to him, everybody else seems rather boring. He sounds interesting, I said. He is interesting. He's from Greece, and his name is Aristide Leonides. She added with a smile, and he's extremely rich. I wonder if you'll like him. Do you? I asked. 
more than anyone in the world, said Sophia. Chapter 2 More than two years passed before I returned to England. Sophia and I wrote to each other quite often. Our letters weren't love letters. They were about ideas and thoughts. But I knew my feelings for her were growing stronger, and I believed she felt the same. I returned to England on a soft, grey day in September, and immediately sent a telegram to Sophia. Just arrived back. Will you dine this evening, Mario's Restaurant, nine o'clock, Charles? A couple of hours later, I was at my father's house in London, reading the newspaper, when I saw the name Leonides in the deaths column. Leonides. On September 19th, at Three Gables, Swinley Dean, Aristide Leonides, much-loved husband of Brenda Leonides, passed away in his 88th year, deeply missed. There was another announcement immediately below. Leonides passed away suddenly at his house, Three Gables, Swinley Dean, Aristide Leonides, deeply missed by his loving children and grandchildren. I thought it was strange that there were two announcements. There must have been a mistake. I quickly sent Sophia a second telegram. Just seen news of your grandfather's death. Very sorry. Let me know when I can see you. Charles. A telegram from Sophia reached me at six o'clock. We'll be at Mario's nine o'clock. Sophia. I was both nervous and excited at the thought of meeting Sophia again. I hadn't seen her for so long that when she walked through the door at Mario's, it seemed completely unreal. We had drinks and then sat down to dinner. I said I was sorry about her grandfather, and we talked rather fast and were awkward with each other. It wasn't just because we hadn't seen each other for such a long time. I felt there was something definitely wrong with Sophia herself. Didn't she love me any more? Had she met someone else? Somehow, I didn't think that was the problem. I didn't know what was wrong. Then suddenly, as the waiter brought us our coffee, everything went back to normal. Sophia and I were together again, and it felt as if we had never been apart. Sophia, I said. Charles, she said immediately. Thank goodness that's over, I said with relief. What was the matter with us? It was probably my fault, said Sophia. I was stupid, but it's all right now. We smiled at each other. Darling, I said, how soon will you marry me? Her smile disappeared. The problem, whatever it was, was back. I don't know, she said. I'm not sure, Charles, that I can ever marry you. Because... because of my grandfather's death. Your grandfather's death? But what difference does that make? Because I don't think he just died, Charles. I think he may have been killed. I stared at her. But what a very strange idea. Why do you think that? It was the doctor. He wouldn't sign a death certificate, and the police need to investigate officially why he died. They clearly suspect that something is wrong. I didn't argue with her. Sophia was very intelligent, so I was sure she was right. But even if something is wrong, I said, how does that affect you and me? You work for the government. It might affect your job. No, please, don't say anything. I know it doesn't matter to you, but it matters to me. I'm very proud. I want our marriage to be a good thing for both of us. 
And it may be all right, so long as the right person killed him. What do you mean by the right person, Sophia? I know that's a horrible thing to say, but I'm trying to be honest. Before I could speak, she continued, I'm not going to say any more, Charles. I've probably said too much already. But we can't make any plans until we know why my grandfather died. At least tell me about it. She shook her head. No, Charles, I don't want to tell you what I think. Instead, I want you to see me and my family for yourself from the outside. And how will I do that? She looked at me with a strange light in her bright blue eyes. Your father will tell you, she said. I had told Sophia that my father was assistant commissioner of Scotland Yard, the London police headquarters. I suddenly felt cold. Is it such a serious case? I asked. I think so. Do you see that man sitting by the door? He followed me from Swinley Dean. I shouldn't have left the house, but I wanted to see you, so I climbed out of the window. Darling! Well, never mind. We're here. Together. She paused and then added, And there's no doubt that we love each other. No doubt at all, I said. You and I have survived a world war, Sophia, so we can survive the sudden death of one old man. He probably just died of old age. If you knew my grandfather, said Sophia, you would be surprised that he died of anything. Chapter 3 I had always been interested in my father's police work. He was often in charge of important police investigations, but now that interest was personal. My father had been out when I first arrived home, but this time, when I returned from seeing Sophia, he was sitting at his desk. He jumped up when I came in. Charles, well, well, it's been a long time. We hadn't seen each other for five years. Perhaps our first meeting after so long didn't seem very emotional, but my father and I are very fond of each other. I'm sorry I was out when you got here, he said, but I've just got a new case. Aristide Leonides, I asked. How did you know that, Charles? he asked with a frown. I met Sophia Leonides in Egypt, I explained. And I'm going to marry her. She had dinner with me tonight, though she had to climb out of the window to meet me. My father smiled. She seems very independent, he said. So you want to marry her? Well, it may be all right if... if the right person killed him. That was the second time that night I'd heard those words. So, who is the right person? He looked surprised. Didn't your girl tell you? No. Sophia said she wanted me to see it all from the outside. I don't know anything about her family, except there are a lot of them. My father frowned and sat down. Very well, I'll tell you. Aristide Leonides left Greece and arrived in England when he was twenty-four. Just then, the door opened, and Chief Inspector Taverner came in. We'd known each other for many years, and said hello warmly. Taverner is in charge of the case, explained my father, so he can correct me if I'm wrong. As I was saying, Leonides came to London and then started a restaurant, which was very successful. Soon he owned seven or eight restaurants, all making money, and then he started a large business. Associated Foods, supplying food all over the country. Leonides had a natural ability for business and making money, said Taverner, though, of course, he was always a bit dishonest, a bit crooked. 
He never actually broke the law, but he came close to doing so. He doesn't sound a very attractive person, I said. It's strange, but he was attractive, said Taverner. He had a strong personality, and though he was short and rather ugly, women always fell in love with him. He married a woman from a well-known family in the country, said my father. Her parents didn't like it, but she was determined to marry him, and it was a very happy marriage, I believe. Leonides built a rather ridiculous-looking house at Swinley Dean, and he and his wife lived there with their five children. Then his wife died. Leaving him with five children? I asked. Yes, but there are only two children still left alive, said my father. Roger, the eldest son, who's married but has no children, and Philip, who married an actress and has three children, Sophia, Eustace, and Josephine. And now they all live together at the same house. Three gables, I said. That's right. Roger moved there after his house was bombed in the war, and Philip and his family have lived there for a few years. And there's an old aunt, Miss Edith de Havilland, sister of the first Mrs. Leonides. She always hated Aristide Leonides, but when her sister died, she came to look after the children. Well, that's a big family, I said. Who do you think killed Aristide Leonides? Tavener shook his head. I don't know, he said, and we may never know, but he was certainly murdered, poisoned. There is one obvious suspect, but it will be very hard to get enough evidence. I looked at my father. In murder cases, Charles, it usually is the obvious suspect, he said. Aristide Leonides married again ten years ago, when he was seventy-seven. He married a young woman who worked in a tea shop. And she's the obvious suspect? Yes, said Tavener. She's only thirty-four now, and she's very close friends with a young man in the house who teaches the grandchildren. I looked at him thoughtfully. What was the poison? I asked. The poison was called Esserine, replied Tavener. It was in the old man's eye drops. Leonides had diabetes, added my father, and needed regular injections of insulin, which comes from the pharmacy in small bottles. Using a syringe, the needle is pushed into the top of the bottle, and the insulin is taken up into the syringe for the injection. I guessed the next bit, and it was esserine in the bottle instead of insulin. Exactly, said Tavener. And who gave him the injection? I asked. His wife. I understood now what Sophia meant by the right person. Do the family like the second Mrs. Leonides? I asked. No, replied Tavener. I don't think they speak much to each other. It all seemed very clear. So what's the problem? I asked Tavener. If Mrs. Leonides did do it, why didn't she change the bottle afterwards so it was a real bottle of insulin? It would have been easy. There were plenty of bottles around. If she'd done that, I don't think that the doctor would have noticed anything wrong. Not much is known about esserine poisoning. The doctor only realised it was esserine because he checked the bottle in case the insulin was the wrong strength. So, I said thoughtfully, Mrs. Leonides was either very stupid or very clever. Perhaps she hopes you'll think that nobody could be that stupid. Are there any other suspects? Anyone in the house could have done it, said my father quietly. There was plenty of insulin in the bathroom cupboard where anyone could take it. Someone could easily put esserine in one of the bottles, knowing it would be used at some time in the future. Does anyone have a strong motive? My father sighed. Aristide Leonides was extremely rich, he said, and though he gave his family plenty of money, perhaps one of them wanted more. 
So you think it was his wife, I said. Does her young man have any money? Lawrence Brown, the teacher. No, he's very poor. What do you think of Mrs. Leonides? I asked Tavener. Oh, I don't know, he replied slowly. She's very quiet. You don't know what she's thinking. And I imagine she likes an easy life. She reminds me of a big lazy cat. But we need evidence. Yes, I thought. We all wanted evidence that Mrs. Leonides had poisoned her husband. But no one was really sure that she had done it. Chapter 4 The next day, I went to the Leonides family house, Three Gables, with Chief Inspector Tavener. I didn't really have any official connection to the case, but I had once worked with the police, and my father wanted to know all about the people in the house, from the inside. This is the kind of crime that may never be solved, my father told me. Unless we can get some definite evidence, everyone in the family will always be under suspicion, including your Sophia. Why don't you ask her to help you? So, here I was in Swinley Dean. Once we had driven past the golf course, we soon came to the front of the house. It was incredible. The house should have been called Eleven Gables, not Three Gables. It looked like a traditional little country house, but one that was the size of a castle. It had lots of crooked gables and wood timbers, a little crooked house that had grown up suddenly like a mushroom in the night. It was a Greek restaurant owner's idea of something English. It looks very strange, doesn't it? said Tavener. It's actually one big house divided into three separate houses, and all of them are very luxurious. Sophia came out of the front door, surprised and not very pleased to see me. Sophia, I've got to talk to you, I said. Where can we go? For a moment, I thought she was going to refuse, but then she led me across the grass and through a hedge to an untidy garden where we sat down on a wooden seat. Well, she said. She didn't sound very happy. I told her what my father had said and explained that the police needed definite evidence, otherwise the crime might never be solved. I asked if she would help me. Sophia listened very carefully. Your father is right, she said. That's just what I've been thinking. After a pause, she said quietly, I have to know the truth. I have to know what happened to my grandfather. She sounded almost desperate. I didn't tell you this last night, Charles, but I'm afraid. Afraid? I repeated. Yes, afraid, said Sophia. Everybody thinks that it was Brenda, grandfather's wife. I can say Brenda probably did it, but I don't really think she did. I don't think she would take such a big risk. What about the young teacher, Lawrence Brown? Lawrence wouldn't have the courage, said Sophia. Of course, I could be wrong, but Brenda... She shook her head. Brenda likes sitting around, eating sweets and having nice clothes and jewellery, and reading cheap novels and going to the cinema. And I know he was 87, but my grandfather did make Brenda feel that she was an exciting and romantic person. But what Sophia had said earlier disturbed me. Why did you say that you were afraid? I asked. Sophia shivered. Because it's true, she said in a quiet voice. I am afraid. We're a very strange family. We are all ruthless in different ways. That's what's so disturbing. 
My face must have shown that I didn't understand, because Sophia continued. I'll try and explain. In Greece, Grandfather once stabbed two men in a fight. He told me about it in quite a relaxed way, as if it wasn't important. That's one kind of ruthlessness. And then there was my grandmother. I don't really remember her, but I've heard a lot about her. I think she was ruthless in a different way. She was always so sure that she knew the right thing to do, even in matters of life and death. That sounds a bit unlikely, I said doubtfully. Yes, perhaps. But I'm always rather afraid of people like that, said Sophia. And then there's my own mother, who's an actress. She's a darling, but she only sees how things affect her. She doesn't think of anyone else. That's rather frightening sometimes. And Clemency, Uncle Roger's wife. She's a scientist. She's ruthless too, in a cold, unemotional way. Uncle Roger's the exact opposite. He's the kindest and most lovable person in the world. But he's got an extremely bad temper. Things make him so angry that he hardly knows what he's doing. And there's father. Sophia paused. Father, she said slowly, is almost too well controlled. You never know what he's thinking. He never shows any emotion at all. It worries me a little. My dear Sophia, I said, you're getting very worried about nothing. What you're really saying is that perhaps everybody is capable of murder. I suppose that's true, said Sophia. Even me. Not you. Oh, yes, Charles. Even me. I suppose I could murder someone but only for something really important. I smiled, and so did Sophia. <laughs> Perhaps I'm being stupid, she said, but we have to find out the truth about Grandfather's death. We have to. If only it really was Brenda who killed him. Suddenly, I felt rather sorry for Brenda Leonides. Chapter 5 Just then, we saw someone walking along the path towards us. Aunt Edith, said Sophia as we stood up, this is Charles Hayward. Charles, this is my great aunt, Miss Edith de Havilland. Edith de Havilland was about seventy, with lots of untidy grey hair and sharp, intelligent-looking eyes. I've heard about you, she said, shaking my hand. How is your father? I knew him when he was a boy. Rather surprised, I said he was very well. Have you come to help us? asked Mr. Haviland. I do hope so. There are police all over the house. She turned to Sophia. Nanny wants you, Sophia, about the fish for dinner. Oh, dear, said Sophia. I'll go and sort it out. She walked quickly back towards the house, while Mr. Haviland and I followed her more slowly. I don't know what we'd do without Nanny, remarked Mr. Haviland. She does so much work and has been here for so long. She stopped and pulled viciously at a big weed in the garden. I hate bindweed, she said. It gets tangled up with the other plants and is impossible to get rid of. She ground the weed viciously under her foot. This is a bad situation, Charles Hayward, she continued, looking towards the house. I never liked Aristide Leonides, an ugly little man. But now he's dead, the house seems so empty. I've lived here over forty years, ever since my sister died, and I came to look after the children. And you've stayed here all that time, I murmured. Yes, she said. I could have left, I suppose, when the children grew up and married, but I loved the garden. And then, when Philip married and moved back here, I helped look after his children. What does Philip Leonides do? I asked curiously. He writes books, replied Mr. Haviland. 
history books, but nobody wants to read them. They don't earn him any money, but then he doesn't need to earn money. Aristide gave him over one hundred thousand pounds, and Roger is in charge of his biggest company, Associated Foods. All of them are financially independent. Sophia is regularly given a large amount of money to live on, and there's money saved in the bank for the other children. So no one gains by his death. She looked at me strangely. Yes, they do, she answered. They all get more money, but Aristide would have given it to them if they'd asked for it. Do you have any idea who poisoned him, Mr. Haviland? No, I don't, she replied. It's upset me very much to think that we have a poisoner in the house. I suppose the police will think poor Brenda did it. She is rather stupid. Perhaps she got tired of waiting for Aristide to die. If it was her, it will be all right. She isn't one of the family. Do you have any other ideas? I asked. What other ideas should I have? I wondered. She seemed to be intelligent. But as I looked at her, I thought of the word Sophia had used. Ruthless. I remembered how Mr. Haviland had viciously ground the bindweed under her foot. And just for a moment, I wondered if Edith de Haviland had poisoned Aristide Leonides herself. Chapter 6 we went back to the house and through the large hall. At the back, where there would normally be stairs, was a white wall with a door in it. You get to Aristide's part of the house through that door, explained Mr. Haviland. Philip and Magda live in a different part of the house, here on the bottom floor. We went through a door on the left into a large drawing room. It had pale blue walls, which were covered with many photographs and pictures of actors and dancers. There was a lot of heavy furniture, and on the tables were large vases of flowers. "'Do you want to see, Philip?' asked Mr. Haviland. "'I had no idea. I thought I'd only wanted to see Sophia. Should I talk to her father? If I did, should I say that I was a friend of Sophia's, or that I was working with the police?' Mr. Haviland didn't give me time to say anything. "'We'll go to the library,' she decided and led me out of the drawing-room, along a corridor, and through another door. We entered a big, cold room full of books, not just on the bookshelves, but also on the chairs, tables, and even the floor. A tall man, of about fifty years old, stood up as we came in. Philip Leonides was very handsome, which surprised me, since people said his father was so ugly. But this man had a perfect-looking face with a straight nose and fair hair that was just beginning to turn grey. Philip, said Edith to Haviland, this is Charles Hayward. Uh, how do you do? said Philip Leonides, shaking my hand. I couldn't tell if he had ever heard of me. He certainly didn't seem very interested. Are the police still here? asked Mr. Haviland. I believe Chief Inspector Tavener is coming to talk to me soon, Philip replied. I don't know where he is now. Just then, the door burst open and a woman came in. She had big blue eyes and lots of red hair and was wearing a luxurious pink dressing gown. She was talking very quickly, in a clear, attractive voice. Somehow, it seemed that three women, not just one, had entered the room. Darling, she said. I simply can't decide what to wear at the inquest. Something dark, of course, uh, though not black. Perhaps dark purple. Oh, how calm you are, Philip. How can you be so calm? Don't you realise we can leave this awful house now and be free? Of course, we could never leave when your grandfather, the poor old darling, was alive. He really did love us. But if we'd left, that woman upstairs would have made sure she got the house, the money, everything. But now, now we can produce that new play, and this murder will give us lots of free publicity. So, 
This was Magda Leonides, Sophia's mother. I'm looking forward to talking to the inspector, she continued. He'll want to know exactly how and when everything happened, and I'll tell him all the little things I noticed and wondered about at the time. Mother, said Sophia, coming through the open door, you mustn't tell the inspector a lot of lies. Sophia, darling, and I know you're ready to give a most beautiful performance, just as if you were acting in a play, but you've got it all wrong. Magda looked puzzled. What do you mean? You have to act it in a different way, said Sophia. Don't say much at all. Keep quiet and don't talk much, as if you're protecting the family. A pleased little smile showed on Magda's face. Yes, she said slowly. Yes, that's a good idea. I've made you some breakfast, added Sophia. It's in the drawing room. Oh, good. I'm hungry, said Magda, and quickly left the room. Sophia started to follow her mother, then turned back to say, Chief Inspector Tavener is here to see you, father. You don't mind if Charles stays, do you? I wasn't surprised when Philip Leonides looked confused, but all he said was, Oh, certainly, certainly, in a rather uncertain voice. Chief Inspector Tavener came in. He looked calm and businesslike. As I sat down in the background, Mr. Haviland said, Do you want me to stay, Chief Inspector? Not now, Mr. Haviland, but I do want to talk to you later. Of course, I'll be upstairs. She went out, shutting the door behind her. I won't disturb you for long, said Tavener, but I can now confirm that your father did not die a natural death. He was poisoned by a drug called Esserine. Philip did not show any emotion. He must have taken the poison by accident, he said. My father was nearly ninety, and he couldn't see very well. So you think your father put the contents of his eyedrop bottle into an insulin bottle, said Tavener. Does that seem likely? Philip did not reply. His face still showed no emotion. We have found the empty eyedrop bottle, continued the chief inspector. There were no fingerprints on it, which is strange. Your father's fingerprints at least should have been there. Now, Mr. Leonides, he continued, can you tell me what you were doing on the day of your father's death? Certainly, replied Philip. I was here, in this room, all day, except when I went to eat, of course. Did you see your father at all? I said good morning to him after breakfast. Were you alone with him, then? My, uh, uh, stepmother, Brenda, was in the room. Is your father's part of the house completely separate from yours? continued Tavener. Yes. The only way to get to it is through the door in the hall. Is that door usually locked? No, never, replied Philip. So anyone could go freely between the different parts of the house? Yes, that's true. How did you first hear of your father's death? asked the inspector. My brother Roger, he lives on the floor above, came rushing down to tell me that my father couldn't breathe and seemed very ill. What did you do? I telephoned the doctor, but he was out, so I left an urgent message. Then I went upstairs. My father was clearly very ill, and he died before the doctor came. There was no emotion in Philip's voice. It was a simple statement of fact. Where was the rest of your family? My wife, Magda, was in London, but came home soon afterwards. Sophia was also out, I believe, but my two younger children, Eustace and Josephine, were at home. And I'm afraid I have to ask you, said Tavener, how your father's death affects your financial position. My father made us financially independent many years ago, Philip replied. He gave my brother Roger his largest company, Associated Foods, 
and gave me about one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. My father didn't keep much money for himself, but now he has made even more money than he had before. For the first time, Philip smiled slightly. So, you and your brother don't live in this house because of financial problems? asked Tavener. Certainly not. It's just easier for both of us. And my father liked us to live here. I was very fond of my father, added Philip. I came to Three Gables with my family in 1937, and my brother Roger came in 1943, when his house in London was bombed. I see, said Tavener. And now, Mr. Leonides, can you tell me anything about your father's will and how he has left his money? My father was not a secretive man, said Philip. He held a meeting with all his family and his lawyer, Mr. Gateskill, to tell us about his will. My stepmother, Brenda, was left one hundred thousand pounds, and the rest of his property was divided into three parts, one for me, one for my brother Roger, and the other was kept in the bank for his three grandchildren. I mean, my children, Sophia, Eustace, and Josephine. Did your father leave anything to the servants? Uh, no, answered Philip. Instead, their pay increased each year they stayed in his service. And so you yourself don't need any more money, Mr. Leonides? I have enough money, Chief Inspector, said Philip coldly. And if I needed more, my father would have given it to me. I had no financial reason to want my father dead. I'm sorry for asking, said Tavener, but I need to know all the facts. And now I have to ask you some rather personal questions about the relationship between your father and his wife. Were they happy together? Yes, as far as I know, said Philip. Did you approve of your father's second marriage? My approval was not asked, Philip said, but I thought the marriage was unwise. It must have been quite a shock to you, said the inspector. Philip did not reply. Did you get on well with Mrs. Leonides? Tavener continued. Yes, answered Philip, though I don't see her very often. What can you tell me about Mr. Lawrence Brown, your children's teacher? Not very much, Philip said. My father employed him. His references were good, and he is a good enough teacher. He lives in your father's part of the house, not here. There was more room there. Have you ever noticed any signs of a close relationship between Lawrence Brown and your stepmother? was Tavener's final question. No, I have not, Philip replied. Chief Inspector Tavener got up. Thank you very much for your help, Mr. Leonides. I followed him out of the room. My goodness, Charles, said Tavener, as we stood in the corridor. He's a cold man. Chapter 7 And now, let's talk to his wife, Magda, the actress, said Tavener. The name she uses on stage is Magda West. I've heard her name, I said. Is she a good actress? She has starred once or twice in the big London theatres, said Tavener, but she's never become famous, perhaps because she doesn't need to earn her living. If she wants to play a certain part, she sometimes finances the whole play herself. Sophia came out of the drawing room. My mother isn't here, Chief Inspector. I followed Tavener into the big drawing room. For a moment... I didn't recognise the woman who sat on the sofa. She was so different from the emotional woman in the luxurious pink dressing gown I had seen earlier. Magda's red hair was now arranged in an old-fashioned style on the top of her head, and she wore a neat grey coat and skirt and a pale shirt. Please sit down, Inspector, she said in a calm, quiet voice. How can I help you? Thank you, said Tavener. 
Can I ask where you were at the time of your father-in-law's death? I was driving home from London, Magda said. I'd had lunch with a friend and then gone shopping. When I got here, everything was in confusion. My father-in-law had become ill and was dead. Her voice shook just a little. Were you fond of your father-in-law? asked the inspector. We were all fond of him, replied Magda. He was very good to us. Do you get on well with Mrs. Leonides? We don't see very much of Brenda. We don't have much in common. Was Mrs. Leonides happy with her husband? Oh, I think so, replied Magda quietly. She's very friendly with Lawrence Brown, I believe. Magda's body became stiff, and she looked sadly at Tavener. Brenda, she said with dignity, is friendly to everyone. Do you like Lawrence Brown? He's very quiet. You don't really notice he's there. Tavener tried to shock her. Do you think Brenda Leonides and Lawrence Brown were having a love affair? Magda stood up theatrically as if she was on stage. I have no idea, Inspector, she said, and that is not a question you should ask me. Brenda was my father-in-law's wife. I felt like clapping her performance. Tavener also stood up. Thank you, Mrs. Leonides, he said. I followed Tavener out to the door to the stairs. I'm just going up to see Roger, the elder brother, he explained. Can you help me, Tavener, I said. If anyone asks me what I'm doing here, what should I say? Tavener smiled. Has anyone asked you? Well, no, I admitted. If no one has asked you, then don't explain or say anything, he said simply. Everyone is too worried to ask you questions. Hmm, he continued. This door isn't locked. None of them are in this house. You realise, of course, that all my questions about who was in the house that day don't matter at all. <laughs> then why ask? I said. Because I want to hear them talk, Tavener said. I might learn something. Everybody in the house had the means and the opportunity to kill the old man. What I want is a motive. He knocked on the door at the top of the stairs. It was opened by a big, tall man with strong shoulders, dark hair, and an ugly but pleasant face. You must be Chief Inspector Tavener, he said. I'm Roger Leonides. Uh, do come into the sitting room. He led us into a completely white room, which was light and airy and had very little furniture. It was very different to Magda's crowded room downstairs. I'll go and get my wife, Clemency, said Roger. Oh, you're here, darling. I must get some cigarettes, if you don't mind. He bumped into a table and went clumsily out of the room. I looked at Clemency Leonides. She was about fifty, with short grey hair that suited her intelligent and sensitive face. Her eyes were grey, and she wore a simple red wool dress that fitted her slim figure perfectly. She had a strong personality, and I understood at once why Sophia had said she was ruthless. The room was cold, and I shivered a little. Please sit down, Chief Inspector, said Clemency, in a quiet voice. Is there any news? Your father-in-law died of esserine poisoning, replied Tavener. It was definitely murder. This will upset my husband very much, said Clemency. He's a very emotional person, and he loved his father dearly. Did you get on well with your father-in-law, Mrs. Leonides? I got on quite well with him, she said quietly. But I didn't like him very much. I didn't like the way he did business. What about Brenda Leonides? Do you think she was having a love affair with Lawrence Brown? I don't think so, 
said Clemency, but I don't really know. She didn't sound at all interested. Roger Leonides came hurrying back. Well, Chief Inspector, is there any news? Your father died of esserine poisoning, explained Tavener. My God, exclaimed Roger. So that woman murdered him. She couldn't wait for him to die. Why do you think that? Tavener asked. Who else could it be? said Roger, walking quickly up and down the room, pulling his hair. I've never trusted Brenda. Never liked her. None of us did. Why did father marry her? At his age, it was madness. Madness! My father was an amazing man, Chief Inspector. He did everything for me, and I... I failed him. He sat down heavily. Now, Roger, please don't get upset, said his wife quietly. Chief Inspector Tavener wants our help. I'd like to strangle that woman with my own hands, said Roger angrily. Yes, I'd strangle her if she were here. He was shaking with anger. Roger, said Clemency sharply. Sorry, dearest, said Roger, calming down. I do apologize. I... Please excuse me, he said to us, and went out of the room again. He wouldn't really hurt anyone, said Clemency with a slight smile. Tavener politely began to ask his routine questions, which Clemency Leonides answered clearly. Roger had been in London on the day of his father's death, working at the head office of Associated Foods. He had returned in the afternoon and had spent some time with his father. She herself had been at work in London and had returned to the house just before six o'clock. Did you see your father-in-law on the day of his death? asked Tavener. No, replied Clemency. I saw him the day before, after dinner, but not on the day he died. I did go to his part of the house to get something for Roger, but I didn't disturb the old man. When did you hear that he was ill? Brenda came rushing over, just after half-past six. I knew that these questions weren't important, but they gave Inspector Tavener the chance to look closely at the woman who answered them. Then Tavener asked if he could look round their part of the house. Clemency was surprised, but showed us the plain, simple rooms, which were all very tidy and neat. Then she opened another door, saying, Roger will be in here. It's his own special room. Come in, said Roger, as his wife left us. His room was very different to those in the rest of the house. It was a personal room, full of papers, photographs and big chairs, and although it was untidy, it was pleasant and comfortable. I'm sorry about my behaviour earlier, said Roger. I get very emotional at times. He looked round to make sure that Clemency was not with us. My wife has been wonderful, he said. I admire her so much. She's had such a hard life. She looked after her first husband, who died, and I was so glad when she agreed to marry me so I could take care of her. I'm so lucky. I'd do anything for her. Again, Tavener politely began to ask his questions. When did you first know that your father was ill? Brenda rushed over to tell me. I had left him only half an hour before, and he was all right then. I rushed over to see him. He couldn't breathe properly. And then I ran down to Philip, who phoned for the doctor. I... We couldn't do anything to help. When Tavener and I left Roger's part of the house, the chief inspector said... He's very different to his brother, isn't he? I agreed with him. And the women they've married are very different too, Tavener added. Clemency and Magda were indeed very different, and yet I thought that both married couples seemed happy together. But I don't think Roger is a poisoner, continued Tavener, though his wife might be. No... I think it's much more likely to be Brenda Leonides. 
Though I don't know if we'll ever get any evidence. Chapter 8 Now we went to Aristide Leonides' part of the house, where a servant opened the door and led us into a big drawing room. Although it was the same size as Philip and Magda's drawing room, this room looked very different. It had bright sofas and luxurious curtains, and on the wall was a painting of a little old man. He had sharp but kind-looking dark eyes and crooked shoulders. He looked powerful and full of life. That's Aristide Leonides, said Taverner. He certainly had a strong personality. Yes, I agreed, looking at the painting and the little man's lively dark eyes. Now I understood why Edith de Havilland thought that the house seemed empty without him. There's a painting of his first wife over there, said Taverner. I looked at the picture of a typical English country lady. Her face was handsome, but rather dull and lifeless, not like her husband's face. Just then, the door opened, and Aristide Leonides' second wife came into the room. Brenda Leonides was quite pretty. She had brown hair and was wearing a black dress, and lots of expensive jewellery. She moved easily and lazily, like a cat. I noticed that though she wore makeup, she had obviously been crying. I also noticed that she looked frightened. Good morning, Mrs. Leonides, said Taverner. I'm sorry to disturb you again. You do understand, don't you, that you can have your lawyer here if you want. I wondered if she understood what these words meant. Apparently not. I don't like Mr. Gateskill said Brenda Leonides, sitting down on the sofa. I don't want him here. We'll start then, said Taverner. Have you found out anything? she asked, her hands twisting nervously. Yes, said Taverner. Your husband definitely died from esserine poisoning. You mean those eye drops killed him? That's right. You injected Mr. Leonides with esserine, not insulin. But I didn't know that, exclaimed Brenda. I didn't have anything to do with it. Then somebody must have deliberately replaced the insulin with the eye drops. It must have been an accident, or one of the servants, said Brenda. We've interviewed the servants, said Taverner, and we don't suspect any of them. Have you any other ideas, Mrs. Leonides? She stared at him. I've no idea at all, she said. You said you were at the cinema that afternoon. Yes, I came in at half past six. I, I, I gave my husband his injection, as usual, and then he, he became ill. I was terrified. I rushed to find Roger. I've told you all this before. I'm sorry, Mrs. Lanides, said Taverner. Now, can I speak to Mr. Brown? To Lawrence? Why? He doesn't know anything about it. I still want to speak to him. She stared at the chief inspector suspiciously. Lawrence is in the schoolroom, teaching Eustace. Tavener and I left the room and walked down the corridor to a large room overlooking the garden. Inside, a fair-haired young man of about thirty was sitting at a table with a handsome, dark boy of sixteen. They looked up as we came in. Sophia's brother Eustace looked at me, while Lawrence Brown stared at Chief Inspector Taverner. Oh, um, good morning, Inspector, he said, looking very frightened. Good morning. Taverner was abrupt. Can I have a word with you? Yes, uh, of course said Lawrence Brown. Eustace stood up. Do you want me to go away? he said. His voice was pleasant, but slightly arrogant. We, uh, we can continue your lesson later, said his teacher, and Eustace walked stiffly out through the door and shut it behind him. Well, Mr. Brown, said Taverner, I can confirm 
that Mr. Leonides died of isserine poisoning, which was injected instead of insulin. I, I can't believe it. it. It's incredible. Would you like your lawyer here? asked Taverner. I don't have a lawyer, said Lawrence Brown. And I don't want one. I have nothing to hide. I'm innocent. Innocent. I have not suggested anything else, Taverner paused. Mrs. Leonides was a lot younger than her husband, wasn't she? I... I suppose so. I mean, well, yes. She must have felt lonely sometimes. Lawrence Brown did not answer. She must have liked having a friend near her own age living here. I... no, not at all. I, I mean, I don't know. It will be natural that you two should have become more than friends. We did not, insisted the young man. I, I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. Mrs. Leonides was always very kind to me, and I respect her, but nothing more. And I... I wouldn't kill anybody. I'm very sensitive, and I'm not very strong. I object to killing. I wouldn't fight in the war. They let me teach instead. And I've done my best here with Eustace and Josephine. She's a very intelligent child, but difficult. Everybody has been very kind to me. And now this awful thing happens... And you suspect me, me, of murder. Chief Inspector Taverner looked at him closely. I haven't said that, he remarked. But you think so. They all think so. They look at me. I, I can't go on talking to you. I'm not well. He hurried out of the room. He's really scared, said Taverner. But that doesn't prove anything. Is he a murderer? I don't know if he'd have the courage, I said. This murder didn't need courage, said the chief inspector. All he had to do was switch two bottles. Then he could marry a very rich woman. It's a shame that the servants haven't seen anything going on between them. He sighed. But it's all theory, he admitted. It's more likely to be the wife. Brenda. Though, why didn't she throw away the insulin bottle or wash it? He looked at me. Go back and talk to her, Charles. I'd like to know what you think. Chapter 9 I found Brenda Leonides sitting exactly where we had left her. Is Inspector Taverner coming back? she asked abruptly. Not now, I replied. Who are you? At last, someone had asked me that question. I'm with the police, I said, but I'm also a friend of the family. The family? I hate them all. Brenda looked frightened and angry. They've always been horrible to me. Why shouldn't I marry their father? What did it matter to them? He'd already given them lots of money, and I was very fond of him. I see, I said. It's true, Brenda said. I was sick of men. I wanted a home and someone to be nice to me. Aristide made me laugh, and he was clever. I'm sorry he's dead. She sat back on the sofa. I've been safe and happy here, she said. Aristide gave me lovely things. She looked at the expensive ring on her hand with a satisfied smile. And I was very nice to him. Do you know how we met? Brenda didn't wait for me to answer. I was working in a tea shop and brought him his lunch. I was crying and he asked me to sit down. I said I couldn't. I'd lose my job. No, you won't, he said. I own this place. He was a little old man but he had power. I told him what was wrong. I was a respectable girl, but I was... I was in trouble. I was going to have a baby. She looked at me. Aristide was wonderful, she said. 
we were married at once. Then I found out he was very rich. It was like a fairy story. Brenda smiled lazily like a cat. And I'd made a mistake. I wasn't pregnant. I was a good wife to Aristide and made him happy. But his family, they were always there, living on his money. They were horrible to me. Roger hates me, and Philip never speaks to me. And now they think I murdered their father. But I didn't. I didn't. I felt very sorry for her. She was alone and helpless, and all the Leonides family wanted to believe she was a murderer. And if they don't think that I did it, they think that Lawrence did, Brenda continued. He's so sensitive, and I've just tried to be kind to him. He has to teach those horrible children. Eustace is always rude to him. He's been ill, you know, and can't go back to school yet. But that's no reason to be rude. And Josephine? Well, sometimes I think there's something wrong with Josephine. She likes to sneak and spy on people. I didn't really want to hear about the children just now. What chance do Lawrence and I have against the rest of the family? Brenda asked me. It could have been one of them who killed Aristide. They don't seem to have a motive, I said. But I don't have a motive, Brenda said, and nor does Lawrence. They might think, I said uncomfortably, that you and uh, Lawrence are in love with each other and want to get married. She sat up straight. That's a wicked thing to say, and it's not true. I've been nice to Lawrence, but we're just friends, that's all. You do believe me, don't you? I did believe her. I believed that she and Lawrence were just friends, though, of course, it was possible that she was in love with him without knowing it. I was thinking about all this when I went downstairs to find Sophia, who was helping Nanny with lunch. She led me into the empty drawing room. Well, she said, what did you think of Brenda? I felt sorry for her. Sophia looked amused. I see, she said. Yes, Brenda does seem to get on well with men. I was annoyed. I can see her point of view, that's all, I said. Has anyone in your family ever been nice to her? No, we haven't been nice to her, said Sophia. Why should we be? You've seen Brenda's point of view. Now see things from my side. I don't like the kind of woman who pretends she's going to have a baby so she can marry a rich old man. Was she pretending about the baby? I asked. I don't know, but I think so, said Sophia. But she didn't fool Grandfather. He knew what he was doing, and he got what he wanted. From his point of view, the marriage was a complete success. Was employing Lawrence Brown as a teacher a success too? I asked ironically. Sophia frowned. Perhaps Grandfather wanted to keep Brenda happy and amused by giving her a mild romance in her life with someone harmless like Lawrence. I'm sure he didn't think it would end in his own murder. And that, added Sophia, speaking with certainty, is why I don't really believe that Brenda or Lawrence did it. Because Grandfather would have known. That sounds very unlikely, I said doubtfully. But you didn't know, Grandfather, she answered. Is Lawrence very frightened? Yes, he is, I said. I don't understand how any woman could fall in love with a weak man like him. Don't you, Charles? Actually, Lawrence is very attractive, and you seemed to like Brenda very much. Don't be silly, I said. She's not even pretty. No, but she made you feel sorry for her, said Sophia. Brenda's not very pretty, and she's not very clever. But she does make trouble. She's made trouble already between you and me. Sophia, I exclaimed as she moved towards the door. Forget it, Charles. I must go to the kitchen and help Nanny with lunch. I remembered something that had puzzled me. Sophia, 
Why do you have to do that? Why don't you have more servants in a house this size? Sometimes we do have more servants, she replied, but then mother upsets them and they leave. Apart from nanny, we don't have any permanent servants at the moment, so I have to help as much as I can. Sophia went off to the kitchen, and I sat down in one of the big chairs to think. Upstairs I had seen Brenda's side of the story, and now I had seen Sophia's side. I realised that it was quite natural for Sophia and her family to dislike Brenda so much. But I saw something that they didn't see. They were rich and powerful, with a safe place in society. They didn't know what it was like to be poor and helpless. Brenda Leonides had wanted pretty things and a safe home, and in exchange she had made her old husband happy. I felt sorry for her. I could see both her side of the story and Sophia's side. But who was right? I hadn't slept well the night before and had got up early that morning. Now, in the warm room and the comfortable chair, my body relaxed and my eyes closed, and I went to sleep.